Good evening, and welcome once again to another edition of our Wednesday night Bible study here at the New Hope Baptist Church at um, in Covington, Georgia. We thank you for your uh, being able to come and just share with us on uh, tonight. Uh, a lot's going on, and uh, we need to be cognizant of what's happening around us. We're still praying for our nation. Our nation is in the middle of turmoil right now, and we're praying for our nation. We're still lifting up uh, the Floyd family uh, and those other families that have been uh, recently uh, affected uh, by uh, police violence and uh, other situations. Uh, I believe that was a, um, um, a brother in, um, I believe is in Louisville, who was just killed the other night. A um, as a result of uh, an incident during the protest. So we just pray uh, for our nation. We are still in the middle of a pandemic and there's still people uh, suffering from the coronavirus, COVID-19, and we're lifting them up in our prayers also. I wanna remind you as we do every week uh, of our prayer line, which will be uh, on tomorrow night Thursday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, you can call at 717-257-8948. Uh, and the access code is 977-3571-POUND. You can call uh, anytime before 6.45 p.m. on any Thursday. Uh, for specific uh, prayer concerns, you can call or text them in. And that number is 762-499-3555. Uh, and you can uh, leave a voicemail or a text message 
anytime before 7 p.m. Uh, for prayer uh, concerns. Let's go to the Lord right now in prayer. Father God, we come now in the name of Jesus. And as we come, we thank you, God, uh, for this day. We thank you for uh, keeping us safe uh, throughout this day. We thank you, God, for your love and your mercy uh, that is ever with us. Uh, Father, we pray now that you forgive us of our sins, our sins of omission, as well as our sins of commission. We pray, O oh God, for those who are sick among us, those who are jobless, those who are going through financial hardships. God, just be a God in the midst. We pray for those families, O oh God, that are bereaved. And then, Lord, we lift up our nation to you. God, that you just touch, heal, and deliver. Touch hearts, touch minds. And God, that we may come on one accord, one accord and that our land will be governed and that we will live in peace. This we pray now. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, God bless you. We have an exciting study tonight, and I'm excited to bring this to you. We're going to be talking about changing, uh, changing black skin and leopard spots. And we're going to talk about, we're talking about the whitewashing of the Bible, uh, the whitewashing of the Bible, changing black skin and leopard spots, the whitewashing of the Bible. So we're going we're gonna to dive right into the study because we have a lot to cover tonight. And uh, hopefully this, uh, this lesson will be a, a blessing to you. And hopefully you will share this video with your, with your friends. And uh, if anytime you want a a, the PowerPoint presentation that we normally uh, present on your screen. If you want a personal copy of that, you can feel free to email me, uh, request a copy at uh, Harold, that's H A R O L D uh, 8860 at Comcast.net. And I'll be more than happy to uh, send you a, uh, a copy. Let's begin tonight. Changing black skin and leopard spots. The whitewashing of the Bible. And our primary sources uh, where most of this material came from, uh, we had three primary sources. Uh, the first being a book uh, by, by Dr. William Dwight McKissick, Sr. Uh, this book was written some time ago, and it's called Beyond Roots in Search of Blacks in the Bible. And then he followed that uh, book up uh, later on with another book called Beyond Roots uh, 2, if anybody asks you who I am. And this is a deeper look, a deeper look at blacks in the Bible. And he's co-authored with this book uh, with Dr. Tony Evans or Anthony T. Evans. So that's... Uh, those are two of the primary sources we will be using uh, that we use to uh, uh, for this uh, presentation. And I strongly urge you, uh, if you can, uh, just Google those books uh, and uh, pick up your copy. I, I it's highly recommended reading. Another source we use was a book uh, by Arthur C. Uh, Costas, Constance. Uh, and the title of it is Noah's Three Sons. And this is human history in three dimensions. Uh, so those were the three sources we used primarily uh, to prepare and to present this presentation. The two books by McKissick and Evans and the book by uh, Constance, Noah Three Sons. So let's dive into the content. Jeremiah asks a question, Jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23. The question is this, 
can the Cushite change his skin or a leopard his spots? If so, you might be able to do what is good, you who are instructed in evil. And that is coming from the Christian uh, Standard Bible, the 2017 edition. Reading that same uh, text from the King James, it goes like this. Can the Ethiopian change his skin or the leopard his spots then may ye also do good that are accustomed to do evil so this is uh both of this is jeremiah chapter 13 and verse 23 and we have it in the uh, christian standard bible that's the 2017 edition and also our King James Bible. Now in reading this, I notice in the study notes of the New International Study Bible. This is what I found in the study notes on this verse for the New International from the New International Study Bible. It was revised standard version. I'm sorry, it's a new interpreter's study Bible. The new interpreter's study Bible. And this is what the author says, and as a comment to, to that verse, Jeremiah 13 and 23. He says, her character will not change. Her is referring to Judah. Her character will not change, charges the Lord, anymore than the dark-skinned people from the African nation of Ethiopia or Nubia, which is modern-day Sudan, can change their skin, nor leopards their spot. The verse uses skin color to describe unalterable nature and to compare it to her, that is Judah, unalterable wickedness. Skin color was not a cause of discrimination in ancient cultures. Now, we, we went over that. We touched on that a little bit last week when we talked about uh, slavery in the Bible. Uh, remember, slavery in the Bible uh, was not uh, uh, the same as uh, slavery in North America or in America. They were two different things. And skin color was not a cause of discrimination in ancient cultures. Why? Here it is. Most of the peoples of the Bible were dark skinned and not Caucasians. So skin color was much, wasn't much of an issue because everybody basically had the same variation of skin color. Most of the peoples of the Bible were dark-skinned and not Caucasians. So the passage was a proverb. It's a proverb which spoke to the resolve of Judah not to change her ways, to repent or to turn back to God. Here's the point of the, par of the proverb. Just as it was impossible for a Cushite, an Ethiopian, to change the color of his skin or for a leopard to change his spot, it was highly unlikely that Judah would repent. They were bent on destruction. That's the point of the proverb. It's merely stating a natural fact that it is impossible for the Cushite or the Ethiopian to change the color of his skin or the, for a leopard to change 
his spots. And just as it was impossible for an Ethiopian or a Cushite to change the color of his skin or a leopard to change his spot, so the prophet said, and God says through the prophet, it was highly unlikely that Judah would repent for they were bent on destruction. The modern equivalent would be to say something, say something like that something would change when hell freezes over. And I'm sure you've heard uh, that, um, that expression before. And since hell is characterized as being hot, thus the colloquial expression is, is hot as hell, hell freezing over is thought to be a virtual impossibility. Thus, in the same way, it was thought that it would be highly unlikely and practically impossible for the stated situation, that is for Judah to repent, for that stated situation to change because they were bent on having their own way and they were bent on destruction. So in both illustrations, in Jeremiah chapter 13, verse 23, and in the modern counterpart, the message is the same and it is impossible. Now, what about the Ethiopian skin? The Ethiopian skin. The proverb is one of many biblical references that take for granted a common biblical truth. The Ethiopian's skin was black. The Ethiopian's skin was black. In other words, the Ethiopians in the Bible were black people. In fact, the actual Hebrew text has a term that is more accurately translated as Cushite. In the Hebrew text, it says, can the Cushite change his skin? Uh, we get the term Ethiopia uh, from the Greek. The Greek, that's the Greek equivalent. Uh, they did not call themselves Ethiopians. The Greeks called them Ethiopians. Uh, they were called, they called themselves Cushites. Thus, in the Bible, terms Ethiopian, Cushite, Ethiopia, and Cush are all synonymous terms. In the Bible, the terms Ethiopian or Ethiopia, Cush, Cushite are all synonymous terms. Now the Cushites or the Ethiopians were descendants of Cush. And Cush was the oldest son of Ham, who was the middle son of Noah. And the term Cush in the Bible literally means black. So in, in the Bible, the biblical Cushites or, or the Ethiopians were black people. In Genesis chapter 10, we have what is called the Table of Nations, and it is a record of the biblical origin of nations and races. That's in Genesis chapter 10, and that whole chapter. Uh, Genesis 10 and 1 uh, says, this is the account of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham and Japhat. Sons were born to them after the flood. And then you go down to verse 32, which is, I believe, the last verse of that chapter. It gives a summary. It says, These are the families of the sons of Noah, according to their genealogies, by their nations. And from these, the nations spread over the earth after the flood. In other words, you remember now, 
because of the flood, there were only eight people saved from destruction. Everybody else was destroyed in the flood. And so from the sons of Noah, the whole world is repopulated. So everybody in the world uh, can trace their origin. Everybody in the world today can trace their origin back to these three sons of Noah. Now, most biblical scholars agree that Genesis 10 is a record of the origins of the ethnic groups and nations of the biblical world. So all nations and ethnicities find their origin in Noah's three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Let's look a little closer, closely at them. Sham, or Shem, literally means name or renown. Many believe that Noah named in this because he wanted, he had a prophecy that he would be world renowned and, and known all over the world. It, as, you know, he would have a great reputation. Now, Shem was the ancestor of Abraham. And of course, you know, Abraham is the father of the Jewish nation. So the Jews would fall under uh, the heading or they would be uh, descendants of Shem. Okay. And if you notice in Genesis chapter 10, if you were to count, uh, there are 26 nations in Genesis chapter 10 that spring from Shem. The middle son was named Ham. And the name Ham literally meant, means hot or black. According to the Yale Anchor Bible Dictionary, it is either economic Etymologically related to the word warm or hot, or to become warm, or derived from the Egyptian chimney, the black land, and that the black land was a name for ancient Egypt. And Ham was father of the African nations and people. And if you were to count, there are 30 nations in Genesis 10 which spring from Ham. So we got 26 nations that spring from Shem, the Jewish people. You got 30 nations recorded in Genesis 10 which spring from Ham, and he is the father of the African nation. Now, the youngest son was named Japhat. And the name Japhat literally uh, meant, was believed to mean, uh, to mean bright or fair. And unlike the sons and descendants of Shem and Ham, who are mentioned in numerous places throughout the Hebrew Bible, the sons and descendants of Japhat are conscious uh, by their absence, are conspicuous rather, by their absence from most of the biblical books because the, biblical, the Bible centers around what happens naturally with the descendants of Shem because that's, how, that's where the Hebrew nation comes about. And it focuses around the descendants of Ham because they live in close proximity to each other and oftentimes they were in conflict with one another, but uh, there's really not that much, much mention of the descendants of Japhat. And Japhat is the father of the Caucasian people of Europe in the north. And there are only 14 nations in Genesis chapter 10 
that stem from JFAC. So uh, as far as the biblical record is concerned, what we read in the Bible, uh, Caucasian people, Caucasian people are in the minority. Most of the biblical characters you read about were people of color. Black people, brown people, olive people, dark-skinned people, particularly in the Old Testament. We don't really, we don't really encounter much of the Caucasian race in the Bible until we get to the New Testament when we're dealing with the Greeks and when we're dealing with the Romans. So let's look at the ethnicity of Noah's three sons. And consider this quote from Dr. William D. McKissick, Sr. He's the author of the book, Beyond Roots in Search of Blacks in the Bible. And that's the first reference we reference. He says, clearly, the Bible clearly teaches that all mankind derived from Noah and his sons. And he gives the references there. Uh, there's uh, Genesis chapter 9, verses 18 and 19, and Acts chapter 17, uh, verse uh, 26. Noah had three sons named Ham, Sham, and Japheth. The name Ham means dark or black. Shem means dusky or olive color, and Japheth means bright or fair. Biblical scholars and at least one prominent anthropologist, and an anthropologist is a person who studies uh, the racial character of, of people uh, and their lands. So at least most biblical scholars and at least one prominent anthropologist considers Ham to be the ancestral father of Negroes, Mongoloids, and Indians. Shem is considered to be the ancestral father of the Semites, or the Semites, that is the Arabic in the Jewish people. Japheth is considered to be the ancestral father of Caucasians, and you can find this reference on page 16 in McKissick's book. Now, when puzzled about the possibility of how Noah could produce three sons of three different complexions and consequently ethnic identities, McKissick writes this. He says, according to Bernson, Burnett Henson, rather, MD, it is possible for a man to father three children with three different complexions, one black or dark, one dusky or olive color, and, one, and a third bright and fair by the same woman. But he says in order for this to take place, either the man or his wife has to be dark complexion or both of them could have been dark. I got of, but it should be or, or both of them could have been dark. Dark skinned people can and often do produce fair complexioned offspring. And this is a kicker here. The doctor says, however, it is generally, or it is genetically rather, impossible for bright or fair complexion persons to produce dark skinned children. So in other words, what he's saying is this, he's saying it is genetically possible in interracial relationships for a white person and a black person to produce a black child or a white child. 
but it is genetically impossible for two white people to produce a black child. And I learned that uh, some years ago, back when I was in uh, high school, when we were doing the X's and the Y's with the genetic uh, uh, table. It's genetically impossible. You can get, you can get white from black, but you cannot get black from white. So what does that mean? Arthur C. Constance, who has a PhD, who had a PhD in anthropology, writes in his book, Noah's Three Sons, and that was published by Zonovan Press, 1975. And he quotes, this is a quote from that book. He says, without becoming involved in the technicalities of genetics, it is possible that Ham himself had been a mulatto. In fact, his name means dark and perhaps refers to the color of his skin. I want to also make an addendum to this statement that the guy, this, this Arthur C. Constance was a white gentleman, okay? He was a white anthropologist. He says this condition may have been derived from his mother, Noah's wife, and if we suppose that Ham had himself married a mulatto woman, it is possible to account for the preservation of the Negroid stock over the disaster of the flood. And this is found in pay, on page 148 in his book, Noah's Three Sons. And I have that in an asterisk there, a mulatto is defined as a as the first generation offspring of a black person and a white person. So what he's simply saying uh, from the from the genetic point of view <clears throat> that quite possibly uh, Noah or his wife or both were black or Noah was black and his wife was white, or Noah was white and his wife was black, or dark skin. But it would have been genetically impossible if Noah was white or Caucasian and his wife was white or Caucasian. It would have been genetically impossible for them to produce three, three children of those different colors. So he's simply saying, uh, there had to be some chocolate milk somewhere in order for that to happen. And here we have the family tree of Noah. Okay. Notice you have, we have Noah. And well, at Pacific, actually, this is the family tree of Ham. Um, we're focusing on Ham. Ham, here's his four sons. That's Cush. Where we get the Kushites, okay? Egypt, the Egyptians were black. Put, we don't have much information. The Bible doesn't say much about this son, Put, but it says a lot also about Cana. Cana was the youngest son. We talked a little, about, a, bit, a little bit about that last week when we talked about the Hamitic curse because. Uh, Noah, when that incident happened, Noah did not curse Ham, but he cursed the offspring of Ham, uh, which was Cana. So note also down here, from Cana, you have these sub-tribes, you got the Amorites, you got the Hivites, the Cenotites and the Zeramites, the Jezebites, uh, the Gergasher Ger Kahites and all those ites, but they came from Cana. So Cush, Egypt, Put, Cana, all these folk in here, Ham, all these folk in here are black folk. Dark skinned people. Now, it has been established. 
that Noah's son, Ham, was black. He was not cursed. His blackness was not a curse. He was born black. So then since that has been established, it stands the reason, biblically and logically, that his offspring would share his same genetic traits since his ethnicity. As we take a closer look, take a closer look at the tree. Notice the stock that stems from Noah's black son, or from Ham's black sons, rather. We had Cush, and from Cush we got Nimrod. We talk about uh, the Bible mentions Nimrod as a mighty hunter. Nimrod was the first great or renowned world leader, and by the way, he was the leader of the Babylonians in Babylon. We have the Cushites, who are the Ethiopians. Egypt, his son Egypt. King James mentioned this name, uh, Mizran, which was another name for Egypt. Uh, they did not call themselves Egyptians, by the way. Uh, they, they call themselves probably Kemite, Kemites. That Egyptian, Egypt is a Greek designation. And then of course, we got put down here. Sometimes it's spelled P-H-U-T, a foot. We don't know very much about him. The Bible doesn't talk that much about him. Then you got Cana, you got the Jezebites, you got the Amorites. And by the way, the Amorites uh, also the Moabites are included in that. Then you had the Hivites. Now, here's some interesting observations. Black people usually identify with the Hebrews, the descendants of Shem. You know, when we talk about, when we preach from the Bible, we usually identify with the Hebrews because we can identify with them being in Egyptian slavery there are parallels between Egyptian slavery and American slavery, and, and, and those stories have been used to empower our people for years. But listen, ethnically speaking, Black people were more closely related to the Egyptians. Because the Egyptians, you remember, they were the ones who enslaved the Hebrews, and they were the descendants of Ham. So technically speaking, the Hebrews were cousins, but the Egyptians were brothers. And by the way, there's an incident uh, where uh, Miriam the, the, and Aaron, the sister and brother of Moses, criticized him for marrying this Egyptian woman, a black woman, and many people have used that story to, to, uh, uh, of that interracial marriage uh, to say that the criticism was that, you know, Moses was belittling himself by marrying this black woman. But you got to remember at the time, the Egyptians were the ruling party. They were the ruling uh, uh, people, and the Hebrews were the slaves. So in the actual context of that, uh, it was more likely that they were saying to Moses, who do you think you are? Because Moses did not marry down when he married that black woman. Moses married up. Now, there's no way you can spend 430 years among a people because that's how long they spent in uh, Egypt. Remember, they went down as honored guests. 70 went down as honored guests. And they were eventually enslaved. But there's no way you can spend 430 years among people without intermingling, intermingling and intermarriages or interracial marriages. Hence, we read in Exodus chapter 12, verse 38, that when uh, they left Egypt, there was a mixed multitude that left Egypt with them. 
here's some notable Hebrew, early Hebrews who had black wives. Remember, Abraham's surrogate wife, Hagar, she was an Egyptian. She was a handmaiden of Sarah. She was a black girl. And because of her union with Abraham, remember they couldn't wait. God had promised him a child. They couldn't wait. And so after 13 years, Sarah convinced Abram to go into her handmaid, Hagar. And from that union, a child is born. His name is Ishmael. And Ishmael is the progenitor of the progenitor of the Arabs. And this is basically why we have the Arab-Israeli conflict today, because both of them are legitimate sons of Abraham. And uh, you can read about that. The Bible says that Ishmael would be, would be blessed also. But Ishmael is a result. Now, the Arabs are a result of a mixture between Shem and Ham. Abraham comes from Shem. Hagar came from Ham. So it's a mixture of, of the Jewish race and the blacks produced the Arabs, Ishmael. And we just talked about this. Moses married a black woman. You can find that in Genesis chapter, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, Numbers uh, 12 and 1. There's a name uh, that's mentioned earlier, Zipporah the daughter of Jethro, the priest of Median. Now, there's some confusion as the way the Bible has that uh, because uh, you could interpret that as perhaps maybe that um, Zipporah may have died or something and, and, and Moses married another black woman. It just depends on how you read the scripture. Even Joseph, the prince of Egypt, married a black woman. Her name was Anasa, Anna, Asna, Asna. And she was the daughter of an Egyptian priest. And she was the mother of Manasseh and Ephraim. And that great warrior who eventually led the children of Israel into the promised land, Joshua, was a descendant of from Ephraim. And uh, the mother of that tribe was a black woman. Interesting stuff here. But you know, eventually someone comes along and reads about all of this and says there must be something wrong. So there's an attempt to change the Ethiopian's skin. So doing the research for their book, Beyond Roots 2, a, deep, a deeper look at blacks and in the Bible, and this is by Renaissance Publications, 1994. As I noted earlier, the authors are William D. McKissick, Sr and Anthony T. Evans, but they note this, and this is from page 15 in the book. It says, from the state of Genesis, we have concluded that Noah's sons, that Noah's son, rather, Ham was black. Biblical commentaries and dictionaries that were consulted did not address the question with a consistent voice. There were neither clear or consistent answers given regarding the ethnicity, ethnicity of Ham, the ethnicity of Ham's descendants, or the etymologic, etymo, etymology of Ham. We did notice, nonetheless, that there was consistency regarding the etymology and the ethnicity of Japheth, Sham, and their descendants. Note now, there was no, there's no debate in academia about the color or the ethnicity of, of Japheth 
or Shem or, e or any of their descendants. The controversy is only about Ham. And so they interviewed this guy, Dr. William Elder, who received his PhD in Old Testament from Baylor University. He was consulted and they asked him whether or not Ham was black. And Dr. Elder, they said, replied that the opinion held by the most respected Old Testament scholars was that Ham was indeed black. There it is. The opinion held by the most respected Old Testament scholars, they all agree that Ham was indeed black. Then the Canaanites came in the question. And the assumption of the conversation was that the Canaanites were black. Because remember, Cana was the son, the youngest son, the one that Noah cursed, was the youngest son of Ham. So since Ham was black, it only stood the reason that his son, all of his sons would be black. Is at that time, he said, Dr. Elder interrupted and said, but the Canaanites were white. Then the counter argument was that if Ham was black and Cana was his son, how could the Canaanites be white? Then Dr. Elder responded, I believe that is right. And they said that Dr. Elder, like most conservative evangelical scholars, had not, th had not thought through the implications of Ham's black heritage. So along comes the curse and the eraser. Continuing with McKissick and Evans, they observe, and you can find all this in their book. According to Reverend Stan Harris, who was a graduate of Howells Anderson College in Indiana, most independent fundamental colleges teach that blacks descended from Ham who was cursed, and therefore Blacks are cursed. Remember, when we read the text carefully, it was not Ham who was cursed. It was Ham's son, Cana, who was cursed. But most independent fundamental colleges teach that Blacks descended from Ham who was cursed, and therefore Blacks are cursed. Consequently, most graduate students, most students graduate from evangelical, evangelical and fundamental colleges with a fabricated or unclear view of Ham and his descendants. They are taught that Ham was the progenitor of the black race and was cursed by Noah. They also note, same page, an alumnus of a well-known Southern conservative Bible college stated that all students were required to take a test that include these two questions. First question was, who was the biblical father of the Caucasian Indo-European people? That was the first question. Another question on the test was, who was the biblical father of the Jewish and Arabic or Arabic people. Here it is. There was no question asked regarding who was the biblical father or of the African or Negroid people. The alumnus said the test left him with the feeling that blacks had no biblical heritage. They were erased by implication. Remember, we went back. If we go back to the table now, there were 30 nations that directly came from Ham. There was an overwhelming presence of black people in the Bible. But yet, at this conservative Southern Bible College, where students were asked, who, were the, who was the biblical father of the Caucasian Indo-European people? JFAT. 
who was the biblical father of the Jewish and Arabic people, Shem, but they were not asked. And there was no question about who was the biblical father of the African or Negroid people because it was not important to them. Yet you have an overwhelming presence of black people in the Bible. The ISBE doesn't recognize me. The ISBE stands for the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. This was this is this was a this was a cornerstone work. It was first first published in 1915 and has long been considered a standard among biblical references. Uh, but it makes this comment concerning Africa. And this is found on page 63 of volume one of the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia. It says, in the table of nations, Genesis 10, the sons of Ham are named Cush, Egypt, or Mizan, you got Push, Put, rather, and Cana. Except for Cana, those descendants occupied the eastern coastline, coastlands of the Mediterranean. These are generally located in Africa. It is evident, it goes on to say, it is evident that all peoples who can be identified as African are Caucasoid. <laughs> There's no mention that can be identified anthropologically as Negroid. You see what he did? You see what they did? They made Africans white folk. There's no mention that can be, he says, there's no mention that can be identified anthropo anthropologically as Negroid. The Nubians, and for that matter, the Ethiopians, while black skinned, this is ridiculous, while black skinned did not fit the anthropological description of Negroes. It will thus be seen that the Negro districts were practically unknown to the ancient Hebrews, though men and women of Negro race must have come from their kin. It seems doubtful, therefore, whether there be in the Bible any reference to that race either collectively or individually. The word Kushite standing, not for Negro, but for Ethiopian. So he's saying an Ethiopian, although he's a Negro, he's a black person, he's not the same black person like a Negro is a black person. He said this term, he said this term is applied to Moses' first wife, and will probably be generally admitted that the great Hebrew lawgiver was not likely to have espoused a Negro woman. Ouch. You got to remember, this is written in 1915. What's happening in 1915? Look it up in your history book. Talk about eraser, erasure and whitewash. According to, according to the ISBE, the ancient blacks in the Bible were actually white people with black skin. I mean, how, how ridiculous can you be? But why not? Why not? Why aren't there any black people in the Bible, according to the ISBE? Well, in the 1800s, there was a shift from the old Hamic view 
to the new Hamic view. The old Hamic view acknowledged that Ham was black. Okay, and they in and in the old Hamic view, people were viewed racially by their skin color. But in the new Hamic view, color is not a criteria for racial identity. The people with dark complexions can be classified as white. The new Hamac view was the academic justification used by the ISBE to classify all Africans in the biblical world as Caucasoids. But if that was the case, and that is the case, then we echo the question that was asked by McKissick and Evans in their book on page 29. They said, if dark complexion people in North Africa were characterized as Caucasoid, why are dark complexion people in America labeled black and not Caucasoid? People born in America who are dark skinned with curly hair are never legally classified as Caucasians Therefore, what is the justification or the rationale for classifying the people in biblical times with similar character or similar, similar features as Caucasians? McKissick and Evans also note that we long for white academia to provide a rational and consistent answer to these questions. And I would propose that perhaps the reason white academia, academia has yet to provide rational and consistent answer to these questions is because there are no rational and consistent answers. It's hogwash. It is an attempt to erase the presence of black people and people of color from the Bible. I am further, and you know, I, I, as I worked on this for this presentation, I was shocked at, at what I'm reading. And even now as I'm going over it, I'm still shocked. But this is what, this is what most uh, pastors and preachers have been taught and the major evangelical theological schools, even some of them are even taught this even to this day. McKissick and Evans note in response, if Nubian or Ethiopians as described and pictured by the ISBE were to have mug photographs taken in America, there would be no question that they would be classified as black. Also, if they attempted to buy a cup of coffee in Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, or Arkansas in a white restaurant during the first half of this century, they would have been denied access because they were Negro or colored. Yet, black skinned, woolly haired people in selective places in Africa and the Middle East are anthropologically classified as Caucasians. And some biblical scholars even go so far as to label North Africa and the Nile Valley areas as Euro-Africa. The denial of the Negro heritage of Ham is consistently upheld in the pictorial Bible dictionary records Ham records that Ham became the progenitor of the dark races, not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, the Ethiopians, the Libyans, and the Canaanites. Ham was progenitor, according to the pictorial Bible dictionary. Ham became the progenitor of the dark races the black Egyptians, the black Ethiopians, the black Libyans, the black Canaanites, but definitely not the black Americans, not the Negroes. 
The New Contact Bible Dictionary states that Ham became the progenitor of the dark races. There it is again. It's amazing how they just had to put that in there. Not the Negroes, but the Egyptians, Libyan, Canaanites. Do you smell a rat? The Living Bible states that Ham was not the ancestor of the Negro, as was once, there it is, erroneously supposed. Now here's the deal. As I stated earlier, there, there, there's no controversy with anybody's color or the color of their descendants. No controversy with Shem. No controversy with Japheth. The only controversy is with Ham, the black folk. McKissick and Evans note, biblical commentators do not deny the Greeks, the Romans, the Germans, that is the European. They do not deny that they can trace their origin to Japheth. Neither do they deny or argue against the fact that the Jews and Arabs can trace their origin to Shem, However, there is much debate on whether Negroes are the descendants of Ham. Hmm. I wonder why. But here's the naked truth. McKissick and Evans note this is on page 25 in the book. To label people who are black, brown, red, or even light yellow with kinky and curly hair as white is scholastically dishonest and inconsistent with the usual acceptation of race. When white scholars conclude that the prominent people of the biblical and ancient world were white or Caucasoid, despite the non-typical Caucasoid features of the people, they are committing a blatant act of racism, almost comparable to the acts of racism perpetrated on blacks and other non-whites by the Ku Klux Klan. Although unintentional, and these are the words of McKissick and and Evan, personally, I don't think it was unintentional. But although unintentional, they say, those in white academia who have utilized Golier's encyclopedia, and Golier encyclopedia is one of the first major encyclopedias that, that redefined this definition of a Caucasian to include black folk as Caucasian. But he says, although uh, unintentional, those in white academia who have utilized Grolier's encyclopedia's broad definition of Caucasian have, in effect, served as the academic and public relations arm of racist organizations. Again, we recognize that this was not the intent of most white commentators. However, such belief give rise to the mindset that blacks are inferior. And what they were talking about when it says this, not the mindset of most white commentators, they, they're acknowledging the fact that, as they said earlier, uh, sometimes it's a case where uh, the white commentator just did not think the whole thought process through. In other words, he made one conclusion, but he didn't realize that if a has to be true and B is true, then C has to be true. He only went to A and B and forgot about C. But whatever the case, whether it was intentional or unintentional, it served and was weaponized as a weapon in a public relations stunt for racist organizations. We are watching movies produced in Hollywood all our lives. And the characters are generally Euro-Americans. Euro Can I tell y'all something? 
there is no way in the world that Moses ran around Palestine all that time, 80 something years, and looked like Charlton Heston. No way in the world. Rarely, he says, are they Africans, Asians, Arabs, Palestinians, or Jews. Certainly, Europeans were present. They were present in the biblical world, but they were not the majority of people. The Europeans, the Caucasian people in the biblical world were in the minority, particularly in the Old Testament. They do not rise to prominence until we get to the New Testament era, era of the Greeks and the Romans. But when you got those Hittites and Jezebites and, and Pezerites and all those people back in the Old Testament, those people were people of color. All of them were not black, but most of them definitely were not white. So Europeans, if you leave out the other races, he says, they said this is historically inaccurate and a dishonest portrayal of biblical history. This is wrong. White academia, Hollywood, and the church must repent for propagating a view of history that is inconsistent with scripture, especially ethnologically. Let me wrap this up with some closing thoughts. So as we wrap this up, this day, as we wrap up this day, let me say a word about and to those who have suggested that the Bible was written by white men as tools, as a tool to keep black people under control. I hope you have, uh, if you follow me in this study so far, I hope you understand that correctly understood, interpreted, and in interpreted, it is apparent, it is obvious that the overall majority of biblical content centers around people of color, not European whites. In fact, most the majority of the biblical writers were people of color. In the New Testament, the only person who is who can be um, thought of to be genuinely or or of not of Jewish descent would be Luke. Even Paul, who wrote uh, so much of the New Testament, was a dark-skinned guy. In fact, uh, there's, a, there's a text in Acts where he was mistaken, Paul was mistaken for an Egyptian. Look at the table of nations. You had 50, 56 of the 70 nations listed would be classified as non-Caucasians. You had 30 from Ham, black people, 30 nations of black people, 26 from Shem, 26 people of dusty, olive color, dark-skinned Palestinian people, only 14 from Japhat, white European or white and fair. Christianity was not, Christianity was not, Christianity was not, Christianity was not first introduced to the African by the white American missionaries. That's a, that, that is a historical myth. Christianity took root in took root in Ethiopia, a black nation, fourteen hundred years before 
the missionaries first arrived in Africa. If we look at the book of Acts, we have somewhat of a chronology of the spread of Christianity. The Africans were first introduced to the gospel in Acts chapter 8 with the Ethiopian, the black eunuch, the black secretary of the treasurer, who, by the way, had came to Jerusalem to worship the God of the Hebrews. He was not an ignorant, unintelligent brute. He was a man of statue, a man of social status. He was visiting Jerusalem to worship the God of the Hebrews. An Ethiopian, a black man, comes to Jerusalem to worship Yahweh, the God of the Hebrews. Well, how does he know about the God of the Hebrews? It may be just because some years ago, the Ethiopians were introduced to the God of the Hebrews by the Queen of Sheba, who visited Solomon. So even there's some roots there. There's some there's some roots already in Ethiopia before the Ethiopian goes back with the gospel. Because he goes to Jerusalem to worship. Now that's in Acts chapter 8. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, but if we say that the book of Acts is a chronological account, then it seems the reason that the, the events that are related in chapter 8 occur in time prior to the events related in the subsequent chapters. We don't have the gospel going to Europe until Paul answers the Macedonian call in Acts chapter 16. So according to the book of Acts, the gospel goes to Africa before it goes to Europe. So if anything, the white missionaries were not introducing the blacks in Africa to the gospel, they were reintroducing the blacks in Africa to the gospel. And that is why the blacks accepted it because it was reminding them probably of something that they had lost. Secondly, before I go to Messiah's tree, you might also note that Jesus was born 500 years before Muhammad. You may also note that one of the reasons the early Blacks, the Moors in Africa, one of the reasons, and I think the major reason, the Moors, the Black people in Arabia and the Black people in Africa converted to being Muslims was because there was a law at that time that you could not enslave Muslims, could not enslave other Muslims. So it was not a matter of faith. It was a matter of escaping from slavery because it was the Muslims who first, the ancient Muslims, who first introduced this idea of slavery to the modern world. In fact, Muhammad had slaves. Mm. Wow. We need to read our history. Not just go by what people are saying. But there's some black fruit on the Messiah's tree. One of the peculiarities of the genealogy of Jesus is the appearance of women. If you were to read anybody else's genealogy in that time, that day and time, women were not usually included in the genealogy because everybody wanted to trace their heritage through the male because he, he's the one who counted. But there are five women, if you look in Matthew chapter one, there are five women who appear on the list of the ancestors of Jesus. 
And of those five women who appear on the ancestral tree of Jesus, four of those five women were black women. You had Tamar. Tamar. Tamar was the Canaanite daughter-in-law of Judah, who also had twin sons by Judah. Now listen, you, you need to go and read Genesis chapter 38. If you think as the world turns, if you think pagan place, you need to read the Bible. I mean, there's some, it's some, it's some twisted stuff in there because what happened was uh, uh, this girl married Judah's son. And I don't know what he did, uh, but the Bible said he did something that was displeasing to the Lord. And it was so displeasing, the Bible said the Lord killed him. So she became a widower. She married the second son. And the second son did not want to perform his duty uh, as being, you know, part of this Levitic marriage deal. You know, the deal was, uh, if 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 a son didn't have uh, uh, a man didn't have sons and he died, then his brothers were obligated to marry his widow so to carry on his family name. The second son didn't want to do that, so whenever he would have sex with the girl, he would pull out before he he ejaculated, okay, and spill his seed. The Bible says on the ground. It's hey, I'm not. It's in the. It's if it's X-rated, it's in the Bible. That's what happened. And 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 so. Uh, the Lord, the Lord dealt with, you know, he killed him too. And so Judah's scared now because Judah's, you know, the, the third son's supposed to be marrying this girl. And Judah's scared what's going to happen to the third son. He's already lost two sons. So he doesn't allow her to marry the third son. And so what she does, she, 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 she disguises herself and dresses herself as a prostitute. And she goes to this certain town and Judah's wife has died. He's lonely. And so he goes, he goes visit who he thinks is a prostitute who is actually his daughter-in-law and they have sex and she becomes pregnant. And as a result, she bears two sons, twin sons by Judah. Genesis 38, juicy reading, read it. Second girl is the right half. This is the prostitute in Jericho. Remember, she's the one who hid the two spies. She was a Canaanite. People in Jericho were black folk. They were Canaanites, remember? The Canaanites were black. And she married Salmon, who was believed to be one of the, one of the spies. They got married. Then there's Ruth. Ruth was a Moabite. The Moabites were black. They were a sub-clan of the Canaanites. Ruth, remember, was a daughter-in-law of Naomi. Ruth eventually marries Boaz. And Boaz, remember, the grandfather of, or the great-grandfather of David. And then you have that bad girl, Bathsheba, who was the mother of King Solomon. And her name literally means daughter of the black one. Anytime you see the prefix bath, B-A-T-H, that means daughter of. Sheba literally means black. So her name is daughter of black. You know, uh, with the man is Ben, with the, daughter, with, the, with the woman is Ba, the daughter is Ba, the son is Ben. Door is Ba, son is Ben, sometime Ba, but Bathsheba. So these three, these these four women, Tamar, Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, all appear. And because these women appear on the genealogy of Jesus, it's like the Holy Spirit saying, hey, wait, pay attention. Because Jesus is not just a white Jesus, he's got black blood in him. He's for black folk too. Praise God. Other signs of blackness are also in the Bible. 
Often terms and names indicate color of et or ethnicity. These list of names are indicative of synonyms of blackness in the Bible. When you see Ham, means black. Cush means black. Egypt or Mitz, Mitzurim, black. Ethiopia, black. Sheba, black. Niger, which is the term from which the term Negro is derived, black. Nubia, black. Nubian, black. Signs of blackness all over the Bible. And yet, we've been led to believe that there are no black folk, no prominent black folk in the Bible. You can't, you can't walk down a Bible street without running into a black man or a black woman. So although many have tried, either through innocence, by way of lack of the scholastic discipline, or because of intentional blatant racism, many have tried to change the Ethiopian's black skin and to erase the leopard's spots. But the evidence of blackness and the presence of black people is abundant in the scriptures. The facts are unalterable as the note in the New Interpretive Study Bible on Jeremiah 13 and 25 states, and that last sentence is a kicker. It says, most, not all, but most, not some, but most, most of the peoples of the Bible were dark skinned and not Caucasian. Now, before I close, let me just say this. I, I, I hope you don't. I hope you don't misinterpret. I am not trying to be racist and 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 and, and, and use this as a, as a as a as a weapon against our white brothers and sisters. That's that's not the intention at all. My intention is to highlight the fact that we're in the book, that we're not just in the book, but black people are all the way through the book. And I also did the study to highlight the fact that in the past, and sometimes even in the present, there are people who claim to be Christians, but yet their racist tendencies slant the way they interpret scripture. Thus, we have even today this, this whitewashing of the Bible. But it's there for all to see. The Ethiopian cannot change his skin, but neither should he want to. The leopard cannot change his spot, but neither, neither should he want to nor does he need to. Red and yellow, black and white, all are precious in his sight. Therefore, along with all the other colors, black is beautiful. No need for change or whitewashing. Because when we go back to our original premise, Noah's three sons, all of them, are brothers. We all came from one blood. Praise God that he made us with variety, that he made us who we are. It was the black people who were the first world rulers who ruled the world in dominance for the first 2,000 years of history. We're all throughout the biblical world. So don't let nobody tell you you're not in the book. Don't let nobody tell you that you're important, not important. Don't let anybody tell you that your blackness is a curse. That's a bunch of malarkey. That's people twisting the scriptures, misinterpreting the scriptures, and, and denying what the obvious for their racial ends and their racial pride. Most of the people in the Bible were people of color. If you're a black person listening to this, you have a rich heritage. 
in the Bible. You have a rich heritage in the Bible. The Bible is not a white man's book. Wasn't written by white folk to manipulate black folk. The ironic thing about that is that those people who are saying that apparently have been manip manipulated by white folk because they hadn't read the book and seen the blackness and the brownness, the tanness that's all over the scripture. Well, praise God. I hope this bless this uh, presentation has been a blessing to you. If it has, share the video with someone else. I strongly encourage you again uh, to, uh, if you can, to find um, McKissick's books. I don't, um, I don't know if you can read this. Beyond Roots, that's the second book we talked about. Uh, the first book is uh, Beyond Roots in Search of Black, uh, in Search of Blacks in the Bible by McKissick. This is, this is the first book. The second one is uh, Beyond Roots. Anybody, uh, Beyond Roots 2, anybody ask you who I am? It's a deeper look at, at uh, Blacks in the Bible. And the third book may be a little hard for you to find. I, it was hard for me to find. Uh, and it may, uh, they're, you know, may, may be able to find it on the Amazon, but it's uh, Noah's Three Sons. And this guy was a white anthropologist, okay? So it's a lot of good stuff in here. So I highly recommend those, and there's a lot of other material out there. But uh, read that, and you'll be enlightened as to the black presence in the Bible. Well, God bless you. It's time to go. I hope you had, uh, uh, I hope this study was enriching for you. Uh, keep looking up. Keep looking up. Because all of us are sisters and brothers. Okay, but we're in the book. Praise God. We're in the book. And we're not just a footnote in the book. We are the main characters of the book. Praise God. We'll see you next time. Have a good night.